There's one more step that happens only in eukaryotes, not in prokaryotes, during the process of transcription. And that is, aside from what we just learned about during the control of transcription initiation and termination, that eukaryotes add a 7-methylguanosine cap to the 5' prime end of a transcript. And when transcription is complete, then poly A polymerase adds a 3' prime A, 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 etc. tail to the end of a transcript. By the way, both of those, again, are important for the stability of the messenger RNA molecule. The 5' prime 7 methylguanine cap, guanosine cap, and the length of that 3' prime tail protect both ends of the transcript from being chewed up or degraded. The third step in processing a eukaryotic transcript, capping, tailing, in the middle, we have splicing. And that's the topic for this video. This is eukaryote specific again. And what this entails is some scientists at some point realized that if you looked at the primary transcript, that is the initial RNA molecule that's produced by the RNA polymerase molecule in the nucleus, it was maybe this long. But when they looked at the same transcript, once it made it out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, which is where translation occurs, they noticed that the transcript the mature messenger RNA, which is what it's called after the messenger RNA of a eukaryote leaves the nucleus, mature messenger RNA, is smaller. And if you looked at the DNA sequence or the RNA sequence, they could see that there were parts of the primary transcript, like here and here, that weren't found in the same transcript once it moved from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And geneticists termed these parts of the messenger RNA molecule that are taken out before the messenger RNA molecule leaves the nucleus and gets translated introns. And the parts that are left in called exons. So in this case, I've diagrammed a gene that has one intron, which we'll call I1, and two exons exon 1 and exon 2. So splicing, the third step of eukaryotic messenger RNA processing, capping, splicing, and then 3' prime poly A tailing. Splicing happens as transcription is happening. So just like we learned earlier, the 7-methylguanosine cap is added pretty soon after that nascent growing messenger RNA molecule exits RNA polymerase. Splicing can also happen while RNA polymerase is moving along the DNA and making the transcript. So splicing happens alongside transcription. And then at the very end of the process, the tail is added. There are not every gene gets spliced. So some genes don't have introns. So this is not something that happens to every gene in every eukaryote. Even more strangely, there are lots of different splicing patterns. Many genes have many more exons than just two and many more introns than just one. So I'm going to go briefly through a few of these different types of splicing patterns. I'm going to focus on three. One is called exon skipping. One is intron retention. And the third is the use of alternative or exclusive, mutually exclusive exons. So we could have an RNA molecule. This is how introns are usually denoted. So here's a messenger RNA molecule transcript. Each box represents an exon. So that's exon 1, exon 2, exon 3. And there are introns in here. Those are what are in between the boxes, intron 1 and intron 2. And so if this is what the primary transcript looks like, 
and then we'd look at the same transcript after it's left the nucleus, exon skipping would look like maybe exon 2 gets removed. along with the two introns, say. So then we'd have a mature messenger RNA molecule that has exons 1 and 3. Exon 2 has been skipped, but both of the introns have been removed. And again, that process of removal of introns and sometimes exons is called splicing. Sometimes an intron will get left in. So if we start with the same initial molecule, three exons and two introns, we might find a, pr a mature messenger RNA that still has intron 1. So it's got exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, but now an intron has been retained. Not all of the introns have been removed. Then there's a case of mutually exclusive exons, where you might find that either exon 1 or exon 2 gets used, but never both. That makes them mutually exclusive. So you might find cases where you either find exons 1 and 3 splice together, or exons 2 and 3 splice together. So it's like the cell is choosing. You get to pick either exon 1 or exon 2, but never both to wind up in the mature transcript. Now there's one last important point, and that is for me to explain to you how the cell knows where to splice. Because you might think it's kind of crazy for a cell to produce all of this RNA when it's going to wind up cutting up and removing some parts of the RNA. A, isn't that cutting up of the RNA molecule and stitching the exons together potentially mutagenic? Can't that process screw up? Yes, absolutely it can. So the good news and the reason that geneticists think that eukaryotes do splicing is because it lets you take one gene and produce multiple different types of proteins from the same gene. So it's a mechanism of generating diversity. On the other hand, yes, it could be mutagenic and the process can screw up. So it's really important that the cell get splicing right. And here's how a cell knows where an intron is located. So let's say this is the three prime end of an exon, we'll call that exon one. And here's the five prime end of exon 2. There is a specific set of sequences that are located, remember this is messenger RNA, in the transcript. These are sequences that are inside the intron. Every intron, the consensus sequence, remember that means that this is not necessarily always exactly the sequence, but it's always approximately this. The five prime end of an intron always has a G and a U, or almost always has a G and a U. Somewhere in the middle of the intron, there will be an A. That's called the branch point. And the very three prime end of the intron usually ends in AG. So there are proteins, the splicing machinery, proteins in the cell that do the splicing, that grab the end of the exon 1 and the end of exon 2 and physically bring them together and connect them together to produce these sorts of splice patterns, those proteins recognize that motif, a GU with an A in the middle of the intron somewhere that's essential, and then an AG. Those are the nucleotides inside the intron that tell the cell where the boundaries of the intron are, thus the boundaries of the exons. When I was drawing alternative splicing, I should have mentioned explicitly that, of course, it's possible that exons 1, 2, and 3 get spliced together with all of the exons removed. And that might be the sort of splice pattern you'd expect. If there are three exons, they would all be put in to the messenger RNA molecule, and all of the introns would be removed. And that's often the case. But as I said, many proteins undergo exon skipping, intron retention, and so forth to generate diverse proteins that are produced by translation of these various RNA molecules. Now lastly, for class next time, I'd like you to think about this. If there is a primary transcript before splicing that has three exons and two introns, given the types of splicing patterns that we can have, 
how many intron 1, intron 2, how many different process transcripts, messenger RNA molecules, can be produced from this simple transcript, three exons, two introns, after splicing? How many mature messenger RNA molecules could be produced? 